Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 4th of March, 2013. The podcast that is licensed for absolutely nothing. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's reorientate the news of the bogus. Several times in the past, this podcast has covered just how little government bureaucrats really care about the homeless. Here's one more onto the pile. In Louisiana, the state health department forced a homeless shelter to destroy over $8,000 worth of meat that had been donated to them. And why? Was it contaminated with E. coli? Was it improperly processed? Was the meat in any way unsafe or otherwise unfit for consumption? No. The one and only reason the health department had for destroying several thousand dollars worth of meat to be fed to the homeless was... Are you ready for this? Because it was donated by hunters. 1,600 pounds of deer meat had been donated to the Shreveport Bossier Rescue Mission by the charity Hunters for the Hungry, where hunters donate extra game to be used to help feed the poor and homeless. But the health department received a complaint. And what was the complaint? That the homeless shelter was serving deer meat. Venison. Not bad deer meat. Not spoiled deer meat. Not contaminated deer meat. Just deer meat. Regular, ordinary venison. I mean, really, who are these people who keep complaining to government about this kind of stuff? It's like some spoiled brat in class tattling on another kid when the other kid hasn't done anything wrong. Teacher, Johnny's using a kneaded art gum eraser. The only thing that would make it more ridiculous is if the teacher actually punished Johnny for it. And that's exactly what happened here. The health department sent out an inspector who told the homeless shelter they were not allowed to serve deer meat. Quote, Although the meat was processed at a slaughterhouse, Bellevue, that is permitted by the Louisiana Department of Agriculture to prepare and commercially distribute meat obtained from approved farms, deer are not an approved meat source to be distributed commercially. And because hunters brought the deer to the slaughterhouse, there is no way to verify how the deer were killed, prepared, or stored. Translation? What? Something happened without us! Busybody bureaucrats sticking our nose into it! They also said, quote, While we applaud the good intentions of the hunters who donated this meat, we must protect the people who eat at Rescue Mission, and we cannot allow a potentially serious health threat to endanger the public. What potentially serious health threat? You never even claimed that the meat was spoiled or contaminated or improperly prepared or anything. There were no tests whatsoever. Nothing done to verify that there was any risk whatsoever from homeless people eating this meat. In fact, you Louisiana Health Department bureaucrats, the only potentially serious health threat I see around here is you. You know what's a threat to the health of homeless people? Not being able to eat meat. You know how to stave off that threat? Let them eat meat! According to Henry Martin, the executive director of the rescue mission, quote, We didn't find anything wrong with it. It was processed correctly. It was packaged correctly. They threw it in the dumpster and poured Clorox on it. Not only are we losing out and it's costing us money, the people that are hungry aren't going to get as quality of food. The hunter that's given his meat in good faith is losing out. The meat processing plant, particularly this one, Bellevue, is losing a lot of money to process this meat and have it thrown in the trash can. By the way, this mission receives nothing in the way of federal, state, or local funding. They survive solely on the kind donations of citizens. Well, when government stooges aren't getting in the way, that is. I think every single bureaucrat who had anything to do with this decision should be forced to reimburse the shelter, the meat processors, and the hunters from their own personal accounts, not from the taxpayer coffers. So what if it's deer meat? So what if the deer were killed in a way the government bureaucrats can't stick their noses into? You know, like on a big corporate farm or something. Oh, wait, I think I just figured it out. These hunters compete with farms, and farms are a big government lobby. Could it be the bureaucrats are hanging the homeless out to dry in order to help protect the profits of their big corporate buddies? Nah, they'd never do that. Would they? One thing that happens fairly often with government school systems is some politician or other wanting to go back to the basics. 
And sometimes they even make that the title of the bill. Case in point, the Back to Basics bill currently in the North Carolina State House. Among other things, the bill would mandate as part of the curriculum cursive handwriting. North Carolina isn't the only one. California, Massachusetts, and other states are passing laws to bring back what they see as a lost skill. Florida actually reinstated it in 2006. According to State Representative Pat Hurley, quote, Every child should know cursive. Our children can't write a simple sentence. They think printing their name is their signature. This comes at a time when more and more schools are abandoning teaching cursive to their students. And the truth is, it's for a very good reason. There is just no place for it in a modern 21st century society. Look at the manuscript writing of even the worst penmanship and compare it to perfectly formed cursive fonts. The printing is easier to read every time. That's why cursive fonts are never used in PowerPoint presentations. The only reason cursive writing was invented was so that a word could be written with a single line so that you wouldn't make as many ink blots by lifting your quill pen. This is yet another outdated relic of our centuries-old school system. It's bad enough that our schools are so slow to change to adapt to modern methods to teach modern minds, but when the government jumps in to hold everything back even further, this is beyond deplorable. The bureaucrats have their excuses already. Cursive is faster, they say. It aids in brain development. But none of these are true. Writing in manuscript is just as fast as writing in cursive, with better legibility. And the brain development that takes place learning and using cursive comes with learning and using manuscript writing as well. There's also the question of how classroom resources are allocated. At best, learning cursive is redundant. So what else could students be learning with that school time? What greater benefits to their education and brain development could they get from extra instruction in math or science or art? That's what retired UNC Chapel Hill professor and former director of literary studies James Cunningham wants to know. Quote, The research says that adults who write manuscript, they write just as quickly as adults who write everything in cursive, but it's more legible. It's just a simple matter that there aren't any advantages to cursive handwriting. He went on to say that both students and lawmakers have better things they could be spending their time on and reiterated the superiority of manuscript handwriting. Kids, and adults for that matter, can write just as fast in manuscript as they can in cursive, with superior legibility. And they can type even faster, which is a much better skill to learn in the 21st century age of computers and mobile technology. And since they're not taking up as much time making pretty curly cues, they can focus on other things, such as spelling and grammar. But I guess this is what you get when you elect politicians devoted to traditional values. Folks, it's long past time that cursive died the death. And if you agree, and if you live in one of these states with stupid backwards politicians who think that kids should learn cursive just because grandma did, maybe you should write them a letter. Ask them if they also think kids should learn how to use slide rules, drive a horse and buggy, or be taught hunter-gathering skills. And when you print out your letter, be sure to use a cursive font. I recommend Voluta Script. Ten points should be fine. Things aren't much better on the federal front. The House Armed Services Committee is considering a bill from Congressman Charlie Rangel called the Universal National Service Act which would, yes, you're thinking right, bring back the draft. The bill would, quote, require all persons in the United States between the ages of 18 and 25 to perform national service, either as a member of the Uniformed Services or as a civilian service in a federal, state, or local government program, or with a community-based agency or community-based entity to authorize the induction of persons in the Uniformed Services during wartime to meet end strength requirements of the Uniformed Services to provide for the registration of women under the Military Selective Service Act and for other purposes. That for other purposes part always worries me, but we'll let that go for now. Yes, this bill, if passed, would mean that anyone between 18 and 25 is a government slave. This would include a two-year period of national service which could be extended at the president's discretion. And guess what? Being a conscientious objector won't get you out of it. The bill would still require conscientious objectors to serve either in the military in a non-combat role or to perform civilian services. And although there are limitations on military service, there may as well not be. They are fully in effect whenever the president declares a national emergency, and when does he not, 
or when the military is engaged in a contingency operation, and when are they not? In the first century of this country's existence, forced conscription was met with intense opposition. It was only attempted twice, in the War of 1812, which failed, thanks in large part to Daniel Webster, and in the Civil War, which is when the first conscription in the U.S. took place and directly resulted in the New York City riots. Drafts were far from the norm, nor were they by any means popular. Then, in 1917, the U.S. tried the draft again to send soldiers to fight in World War I. The protests resulted in the Supreme Court deciding the selective draft law cases in January of 1918, where they found, quote, the grant to Congress of power to raise and support armies, considered in conjunction with the grants of the powers to declare war, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, and to make laws necessary and proper for executing granted powers, Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, includes the power to compel military service. And how do they justify this? Quote, Compelled military service is neither repugnant to a free government nor in conflict with the constitutional guarantees of individual liberty. Indeed, it may not be doubted that the very conception of a just government and its duty to the citizen includes the duty of the citizen to render military service in case of need and the right of the government to compel it. Say what? That's the opposite of rights. It may not be doubted. I'm doubting it right now, you self-superior gang of tyrants in robes. And wait a minute. I thought there was this thing in the Constitution called the 13th Amendment, which says, and I quote, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? What did the Supreme Court have to say about that? Here is the entirety of their argument about the 13th Amendment. Quote, Finally, as we are unable to conceive upon what theory the exaction by government from the citizen of the performance of his supreme and noble duty of contributing to the defense of the rights and honor of the nation, as the result of a war declared by the great representative body of the people, can be said to be the imposition of involuntary servitude in violation of the prohibitions of the 13th Amendment, we are constrained to the conclusion that the contention to that effect is refuted by its mere statement. Really? You are unable to conceive it? That's all you have? An argument from personal incredulity? Listen, you big government apologists, if you want to take our rights away, you'll have to use something more sensible than what creationists use to discredit the Big Bang. Unable to conceive? Conceive this. The one time the United States had instituted a draft by that point, only a couple of years before the amendment was ratified, it resulted in rioting. People were against the draft like they were against slavery. Maybe even more so. Is it really so far-fetched that they had the draft in mind when they included involuntary servitude in the language of the amendment? And the draft is involuntary, is it not? It would hardly be conscription if it weren't. Voluntary conscription would just be recruiting. And it is servitude, is it not? You yourselves called it service over and over again, did you not? This is yet another case of the Supreme Court just deciding that the Constitution must mean something other than what it says, for no other reason than they want it to. So what does it say about Charlie Wrangell that he's trying to get this whole thing started up again and even expanding it beyond military service? The only good news so far is that no other congressman has co-sponsored it. Yet. But it's only a couple weeks old. Give it time. Got a question for you, Charlie. You supported the president's wonderful stimulus bill and jobs programs. If you think it's so beneficial for people to do this, why not just hire them? We still have massive unemployment in this country. How many people do you think would jump at the chance to do this? If you can't find enough people, as Milton Friedman pointed out, it's for one reason only. You aren't offering enough money. So instead of doing what businesses have to do, raise the wages you offer prospective employees, you're wanting to use force to make them do it. Terrific. Don't get me wrong, I don't think this bill has any chance at all of passing, but the fact that it was even introduced is shameful. And this is definitely one to watch, if for no other reason to see what co-sponsors and other support it gets from members of Congress. Because I have this sinking feeling that Wrangell isn't the only one in favor of this. And now it's... 
it's time to revoke the moron license of this week's Biggest Bogan Emitter. Tabitha Coffee is a professional licensed hairdresser who hosts Tabitha Takes Over on Bravo. She recently made moronic comments on her Facebook page about a Missouri bill that would end licensing requirements for hairdressers. Just listen to the fail. Quote, As a member of the beauty industry, it is imperative that our profession continue to be licensed for the continued protection of the health and safety of consumers throughout the state of Missouri. Properly trained and licensed professionals learn how to utilize chemicals and tools safely to avoid injuries and the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, yeah, presumably that's what you go to beauty school for, but shouldn't a diploma be proof enough of that? And really, how much harm can there be from getting your hair cut anyway? I mean, that's what she claims, quote, State legislators established licensing of the cosmetology industry to create professional accountability in the field and to protect the health and safety of the consumer. Trained in the areas of skin and scalp care, anatomy, biology, chemistry, and science-based infection control, licensed professionals care about the health and safety of their clients. Right, because you need a piece of paper from the government in order to care. How many times have we seen hideous oppression in many states in the name of licensing cosmetologists? On average, cosmetologists have to go to 372 days worth of training to earn their license. By comparison, the average emergency medical technician just trains for 33 days. What the smeg does this crazy woman think is so dangerous about cosmetology that they have to train for 10 times as long as EMTs? And EMTs absolutely have life or death responsibilities. They have to worry about dealing safely with sick or seriously injured people. Many of them have to be able to handle hazardous chemicals. They have to deal with needles and IVs and all sorts of equipment that is much more important to have sterilized than a comb. Of course, it varies from state to state. Louisiana, Arizona, and California have the toughest requirements. But guess what? Alabama has none at all. And although the District of Columbia requires licensing after 100 hours of training, they haven't actually implemented it in the 20 years since the Institute for Justice challenged the law. So why doesn't Coffee cite all of these hideous cases of death and disfigurement from all the people going to rogue hairdressers in Alabama and D.C.? Maybe because there aren't any? So why would Coffee be spewing this blatant bogosity? Maybe because occupational licenses boost wages about 14%, according to a 2009 study. But guess what? That translates to higher prices that you pay to get your hair done. And that extra pay is not linked to quality or anything else about the kind of service you get. The extra pay happens because the supply of hairdressers is limited, and for no other reason. In fact, that's the real purpose of occupational licensing, as the Institute for Justice has demonstrated time and time again. License boards are stuffed full of cosmetologists, and they hate competition. Make no mistake, Tabitha Coffee does not care about you. She just wants to protect her oligopoly from competition. Competition like Justina Clayton, a refugee from the Civil War in Sierra Leone. While attending college in Utah, she set up a business doing African hair braiding, a tradition that had been passed down to her in her African home. The state of Utah shut down her braiding business, though, because she wasn't a licensed cosmetologist. The Institute for Justice took her case and won. A federal court struck down Utah's requirement that hairdressers spend 2,000 hours of government-mandated cosmetology training. The judge called it wholly irrational and said it was a violation of her basic constitutional rights. Understand that African hair braiding does not use any harsh chemicals. The hair is not cut or colored and is easily undone. Nevertheless, the same cosmetologists who opposed the lawsuit are trying to get Utah to pass another law to increase the requirement by 600 hours. They claim, just like coffee, that this is to protect the public. I wish they'd stop insulting our intelligence. It's to protect their profits, nothing more. This is blatant cronyism, folks. Personally, government license or no, if coffee does anything where there's even a reasonable chance of harming me, I'm not going to her salon. I like the place I get my hair cut now. All they do is shampoo and cut my hair, and the worst injury I can reasonably expect from that is getting lightly poked with the scissors. I hardly think it's likely I'm going to get typhoid or anything. And even if I do, I don't think a piece of paper from the government is going to protect me. 
If this is really about ensuring the safety of the public to make sure the hairdresser is familiar with basic sanitation techniques, all they'd have to do is require the hairdresser to pass a test. That's what Kansas and Mississippi do. But that's not what Coffee wants. No, she wants barriers to entry to protect her undeserved level of income. And it's that sort of brazen corporatism that gets Tabitha Coffee named this week's biggest bogan emitter. And now it's time to sequester this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! And it's a twofer this week, both repeat offenders. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and President Barack Obama, both spewing bogosity about the $85 billion in spending cuts and how it'll result in the end of the world. Yeah, I'm about as scared as I was with Y2K and the Mayan apocalypse. Let's start with Bernanke. He warned Congress that the automatic spending cuts, which triggered this past Friday, would slow the economic recovery. Hey, Benny, you can't slow something that's ground to a halt. Quote, The Congress and the administration should consider replacing the sharp, front-loaded spending cuts required by the sequestration with policies that reduce the federal deficit more gradually in the near term, but more substantially in the longer run. Such an approach could lessen the near-term fiscal headwinds facing the recovery while more effectively addressing the longer-term imbalances in the federal budget. Yeah, there's a problem with doing it this way. It's been tried before. Oh, they always say, we can't cut a whole lot now, so we'll start slow and make long-term cuts that are more significant. But the fact remains, those long-term cuts never materialize. No Congress can compel future Congresses to cut spending, and every time it's been tried, the future Congress has just ignored it. The second problem is, as many of you have already guessed, I'm sure, these spending cuts aren't spending cuts at all, but a reduction in the expected growth of government. Spending is still set to rise another $4.5 trillion by 2021, where it will be closer to $4.6 trillion without the sequester. Bernanke claims the economy is on the verge of starting to grow again. Of course, he also blamed the fourth quarter dip in the economy on the weather, just to give you an idea of how seriously you should take him. By the way, just by coincidence, $85 billion is the same amount of bonds the Fed is going to buy to try and grow the economy every month. So I don't know what Bernanke's complaining about is the equivalent of him starting a month later. As for Obama, he was in full-on chicken little mode as he delivered a tale of doom and gloom that would have impressed Nostradamus. And that's why it's so troubling that just 10 days from now, Congress might allow a series of automatic, severe budget cuts to take place. Won't help the economy, won't create jobs, will visit hardship on a whole lot of people. It will jeopardize our military readiness. It will eviscerate job-creating investments in education and energy and medical research. Emergency responders will be degraded. Border patrol agents will see their hours reduced. FBI agents will be furloughed. Federal prosecutors will have to close cases and let criminals go. Air traffic controllers and airport security will see cutbacks. More delays at airports across the country. Thousands of teachers and educators will be laid off. Tens of thousands of parents will have to scramble to find child care for their kids. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will lose access to primary care. These cuts are not smart. They are not fair. They will hurt our economy. They will add hundreds of thousands of Americans to the unemployment rolls. This is not an abstraction. People will lose their jobs. All he needs to do now is put it in rhyming quatrains. He claimed there'd be deep gouges in schools, defense spending, health care, law enforcement, social services, thousands of teachers laid off, hundreds of thousands of Americans lose primary care, long waits at airports, criminals out on the streets, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. This over the budget being just 2% less than what it was projected to grow to. Oh, and this is a complete about-face from just four months ago. Already, some in Congress are trying to undo these automatic spending cuts. My message to them is simple. No, I will veto any effort to get rid of those automatic spending cuts to, me uh, to domestic and defense spending. There will be no easy off-ramps on this one. Is it any wonder we can't see any real change in Washington when a reduction in the rate of growth that barely shows up on a chart gets this reaction from the powers that be? 
Folks, we could balance the budget right now and we'd only have to roll everything back to 2005 levels of spending. All we need is people with the political will to do so. Oh, and by the way, Obama signed the sequester into law on Friday. Maybe he's just thinking ahead. While we face another year of continuing unemployment and all sorts of other problems, Obama now has his scapegoat all ready. Why haven't his wonderful policies worked? Blame the sequester. Folks, the only way you could be an Obama supporter now is to be a complete unthinking Obamaton who thinks that Obama is greater than the Pope and farts rainbows. He has absolutely nothing to recommend himself, and he has proven it time and time again. Arguably, Obama and Bernanke are the two men with the biggest impact on how the federal government messes with the economy, and every decision they make is just as destructive to the economy and our lives as the last. The only thing more bogus than that is how many people just blindly go along with what they say. Obama and Bernanke are two of a kind, and it's the kind that just has to be this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! Well, that wraps up this finger licking good edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Please visit the forums at Bogosity.tv, where you can read the show notes and join the discussion on these and other subjects. This podcast is free, but not free to produce, so please use the donate button at the top of the Bogosity.tv website or down the right-hand side of the podcast page and give generously to keep this podcast going. And if you want to donate bitcoins, you can use the bitcoin address in the header at Bogosity.tv. And if you'd like to contribute to the podcast, just send a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at Bogosity.tv. Put it in an audio file, and if it's good enough, it'll get played right in the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Milton Friedman. I think the government solution to a problem is usually as bad as the problem, and very often makes the problem worse. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative 3.0 Imported License. Bogosity. History is written by the winners, and so apparently is economics. That's why there's Liberty Classroom. Probably the best single learning resource for history and economics on the web, Liberty Classroom teaches U.S. history, Western Civ, and economics from actual university professors. There's lots of free material to get you started, including introductory lectures on all these subjects. And when you sign up, you'll get the full site's content for just $99 a year. You can watch or listen to the lectures whenever and wherever you want, even in your car. Learn at your own pace about the subjects you're interested in and become a more effective debater. You'll also get access to the professors via the discussion forum and even live video chats, all for the price of two cups of coffee a month. Use our special URL, libertyclassroom.bogosity.tv, and when you sign up, you'll be helping this podcast too. So bookmark libertyclassroom.bogosity.tv and use it when you sign up. Inform yourself against the myths and propaganda of our society. Visit libertyclassroom.bogosity.tv.